call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Arpit Vyas. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, moderator. Uh, thank you uh, all uh, for participating on this uh, con call. Uh, it hasn't been too long since uh, we met last, so there is nothing much to say apart from uh, that things are moving in the right direction, as you can see from the numbers. And people during these challenging times have and are working very, very hard. The challenge of the manpower is decreasing, but still not at the rate that what we would have liked. As things are still not normal, especially with the nation preparing for the third wave. In any case, one thing is for certain that the faith this management uh, has put in uh, the existing people remains unchallenged, which is now seen to fructify. With that, I would like to hand over the call to uh, uh, to Mark to, to, to give us a short update. Thanks, Arpit. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you're all well. I hope all your families are safe. Uh, so, a few high points, and then we can get into uh, handing over to uh, Hashirbe. Um, the market remains very strong, um, very active. Inquiries continue to come in at a rate which is normal or above normal. Um, as mobility opens up across the Western world, um, we're starting to get requests now for customer visits, uh, audits, and we expect that to, uh, frankly, explode across our global platforms in the next uh, three to six months. As customers are able to travel, uh, we're going to see more activity on the site, so that's uh, going to happen. Um, European operations continue to perform at a very high level. Gladly and very excitingly, Indian operations is coming back on its feet rapidly. The changes that have been made over there um, are enabling us to bring on production units in a very smooth manner and start to uh, address the concerns that our customers have had. And we are starting again to continue in market supply of product. The late phase pipeline remains very strong. Uh, no change there except that it's continuing to be strong. Some of our specific technology plays are really starting to see some traction. So ADCs, micro-reactors, those sorts of things uh, are really starting to gain some traction as well now. Also, uh, gladly, our uh, commitment to R&D that uh, we made uh, a year or so ago is really starting to fructify now. The, we talked before about calcifidiol trials uh, and vitamin D analog trials. Those are now moving ahead for both the USA and Asia in a number of indications. And our first real new project in infection control for years uh, has just been kicked off with a highly respected university in Europe where we're looking at uh, using one of our compounds to generate what we like to call a, a, a super disinfectant. Um, the two lead R&D projects in Holland for uh, the vitamin D technology platform are starting to really show some promise. And one of them actually goes into uh, what we would call commercial piloting within the next four to six weeks. And we're very excited about that. The impact of COVID and Brexit, uh, Brexit specifically for Europe and, and our operations and sales in, 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 out of the UK, uh, they continue to be a challenge, frankly speaking. I think we understand the challenge now. We understand the time and effort needed to ensure that deliveries and shipments are done properly. It requires a lot more pre-planning, a lot more paperwork. Uh, sadly, COVID and Brexit has only done one thing, and that's to guarantee that more trees will die. Um, but we're able to manage the additional complexity and the time taken to do that. Now we understand the issues. Clearly, though, what we see as a, as a, as a reality is that the cost of shipment, moving products around the world both internally within the organization and externally to customers, continues to be a, a more expensive proposition than it was 18 months, two years ago, pre-COVID. And that's something that we are managing with our customers, talking to them about the additional costs, 
and uh, hopefully we're we're making progress in convincing customers that there's going to need to be more money to cover the transportation costs. So uh, finally, I'd like to give you a quick update on the expansion at Rion, which is our French facility in Europe, where we are moving into commercial scale manufacture of parenteral sterile liquid drug. That project is on target, both from a capital and from a time schedule perspective. And uh, the building is now completely constructed and we're now commencing the fit out inside. So with that, I, uh, I look forward to some interesting questions and I'm going to hand over to our CFO, Mr. Hashil Dalal. So over to you, Hashil Bay. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, hello, everybody. A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as far as the financial results for the quarter are concerned, uh, this was a stellar quarter for us on a consolidated basis uh, where we did a revenue of 550 crores. Uh, which is the highest ever that we have done in the first quarter of any financial year. Uh, this represents a growth of 16% as compared to the comparable quarter last year. The, the, the cost for the year, uh, for the quarter, was at about 23%. The employee expenses showed an increase as compared to the comparable quarter last year, largely on account of increase in FTEs. Uh, required for additional development projects coming out of Switzerland. Uh, the EBITDA for the, for the quarter stood at 100 crores. This represents 18.3% as a percentage of the revenue uh, as compared to 9% uh, that we had last year. Uh, the, the depreciation and amortization was more or less equal to what we had in the comparable quarter last year. Finance cost stood at uh, 12.3 crores as, as compared to 11.5 crores in the comparable quarter. All of this translated into a profit before tax of uh, 24 crores and a profit after tax of uh, 16 crores. The major contributors to the, to the revenue uh, were, were specifically speaking three of them uh, as far as the growth in the revenue is concerned. Uh, one was Grand India, we did a, which did a revenue of 32 crores as compared to 14 crores in the, in the comparable quarter last year. So we are progressively seeing an increase in the Grand's revenue coming out of India, and, uh, which is a very good news. And this, uh, this, this is directly related to the, to the increase in the operations that we are seeing out of the bubble size. Grand's UK did a revenue of 32 crores as compared to uh, 25 crores in the comparable quarter. And uh, France, uh, Switzerland, France, and China put together stood at 320 crores as compared to 309 crores in the, in the comparable quarter. So overall, uh, the Kran's contribution to the revenue was 70%, uh, while that of marketable molecules was 30%. And uh, usually the CRAN's contribution is at around 75%. Uh, but the reason why the marketable molecules contribution is higher is because Carbogenesis BB had a fantastic quarter where the revenues stood at 117 crores as compared to 72.8 crores in the comparable quarter, which represents an increase of 60%. So this was driven uh, by the increase in sales of both cholesterol as well as uh, vitamin D analogs uh, that were manufactured out of carbogenesis BV. On the margins front, uh, carbogenesis uh, Switzerland, France, and China put together did a did an EBITDA margin of 19.3% as compared to 16.2% in the comparable quarter. So thus we are, uh, thus we saw an increase in the EBITDA margin as well. Uh, Crans UK did a margin of 19.6% as compared to 15.3%, uh, while Carbogenesis BV stood at 29.5% as compared to 32% in the comparable quarter. This, this is uh, largely on account of a uh, higher share of cholesterol as compared to vitamin D analogs in this particular quarter as compared to Q1 of FI21. So during the year, we do expect uh, the, the, an increased revenue of vitamin D analogs uh, in Netherlands as well. The capital expenditure for the quarter uh, was approximately 12 million US dollars, 
uh, which majorly includes the CapEx at ITAR Swiss and France sites. So that's part of the overall capital expenditure that we are currently in the undertaking uh, for the capacity expansion. The net debt, uh, excluding these liabilities, stood at, uh, at 101 million, which is a similar level that we saw uh, uh, that we saw on June 30th, 2021, as well as on March 31, 2021. So overall, uh, this, this was a good quarter for us, and uh, you know we we do expect that uh, we should see uh, similar kind of quarters in the current financial year, uh, which would help us to increase our revenue substantially as compared to the last financial year, and this would also translate into higher margins. With that, uh, I'd like to hand over the call to Mr. Sanjay Mochmudar, our independent director. Uh, thanks, Arshil. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, uh, as you can see, uh, things are looking much better now. More importantly, as Mark and um, Arshil explained, Bavla site, uh, I think almost 60% of it is now becoming operational. Uh, it has become operational in Q1, and I think in next couple of quarters, the operation that Bavla should restore to a re almost uh, the pre-EDQM levels uh, in next one or two quarters, hopefully. And uh, overall, I think this year would be much, much better than previous year, uh, which I would say that uh, 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 overall, both from a growth standpoint as well as from a EBITDA and uh, 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 profitability, which are uh, reported, it should be definitely... Uh, much, much better, and I think uh, while it is a bit early for us to be uh, clear in terms of where we should, I think we should end the year definitely at the top line of uh, uh, which showing some growth over the previous year and significant growth in bottom line with a positive appetite and a positive profitability. I think uh, with this, moderator, let's throw the house open for Q&A. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Anyone who <coughs> wishes to ask a question, they may please press star and one. First question is on the line of Karan Kurana from Monarch AIS. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, Karan, please go to the question. Yeah, hi. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, two questions I had. I think uh, I want to kind of uh, get the management's color on the overall beta margins going forward. And uh, um, across the board, it seems like that Crams is apparently a higher margin business. So um, uh, some color on that. And uh, what is the management's plan to deleverage the balance sheet a little bit going forward? As it seems like we've highly leveraged as of right now. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so Karan, if I understood your question correctly, because uh, you, you you were not that audible. So, one you would like to understand on the on the EBITDA, um, and uh, and and also something on the balance sheet. Yes, yes, please. Um, the, the the debt on the balance sheet, as well as uh, the margin profile in our Crams business, right? Because apparently, uh, Crams essentially is a higher margin business, right? So, wanted some color on on that from the balance sheet. Yes, yeah, so on the on the on the cram side, uh, uh, you know, we have essentially two parts to that particular business. One is the contract research and development part, and the second is the contract manufacturing services that we offer to the customers. So on the development side, uh, our EBITDA margins would be the highest when the product gets into into validation, uh, while the preclinical phase one, phase two, uh, the margins would be lower as compared to validation. So uh, in validation is where we make our highest margins. Once the molecule gets into the commercial phase, that's on the on the manufacturing side, 
uh, we might see some kind of a discounting offer to the customer because the quantity is increased significantly. Uh, so, but, but yeah, I'm still the margins remain much higher as compared to the preclinical phase one, phase two. So that's how the overall margins are split on the on the cram side. Uh, since the since the margins on validation and manufacturing services are higher, and um, you know, since we have large scale manufacturing assets in India. Uh, the EBITDA margins in India, which you know, India essentially does bulk of the manufacturing. The margins are are much higher as compared to our Swiss entity. So the right way to look at our margins would be to take a combination of uh, of all of the entities that are directly or indirectly engaged in the cramps business. Uh, so on the cramp side, our EBITDA margins would be roughly about. Uh, uh, I, I would say an average of 25 to 30 percent. Um, while on the marketable molecule side, um, you know, you, you, with the vitamin D business doing exceedingly well for us, and if you see the margins of Netherlands over the last uh, four or five years, we have been doing an EBITDA margin of 30 percent uh, plus. So overall, um, you know, uh, the cramps business, yes, it, it does a higher margin, but it's largely on the validation and uh, and commercial side. While even uh, our vitamin B business that we have out of the Netherlands, that does an EBITDA margin of 30% plus. So, you okay. know, overall, just to add, I think in a normalized situation, not I'm not talking of this year, you can take a blended EBITDA margin of say from next year onwards around 25 to 26%. That's on a consolidated basis, everything put together. Yeah. Okay, that's on the console basis. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and my second question was on the debt on our balance sheet, right? So uh, what are the plans going forward um, uh, when it comes to deleveraging it or, uh, you know, so that our bottom line could kind of essentially look a bit brighter? So as far as the debt on the balance sheet is concerned, uh, on a net debt basis, you know, we are at about 100 million. And, uh, you know, the good thing for us is all of our debt is denominated in foreign currency. And that is the reason the interest cost on the debt, on the debt is quite low. So, uh, you know, on one side, we have, uh, we, we have long-term and short-term loans, uh, which are essentially used for CapEx and, uh, and working capital, respectively. And on the other side, on the asset side, you know, we have uh, we, we have sizable amount of liquid investments as well as uh, cash and cash equivalents. So, um, you know, the thought is that uh, rather than paying off the, the, the cheaper debt that we have on the balance sheet, we would rather make a positive return on the investments uh, that we are holding on the asset side. But on a net debt basis, I think we are pretty much comfortable with a that of anywhere between 100 to 120 million. Okay, thanks. thanks. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is on the line of Sai Kumar as an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I congratulate on a good set of numbers. I hope uh, Dishman Garbhajan will uh, do much better from here and turn positive. So my question is on the uh, API. 16 APIs are in the phase three development. So when can we expect the commercialization of these molecules, uh, roughly a time frame? And uh, what is the revenue potential from, from these 16 molecules? Okay, uh, the first one is easier to answer than the second one. Um, what we've been consistent about is the run rate of converting validation or late phase into commercial is about one and a half per per year per 18 months, and it normally takes a rolling program of a year or more to get something out of validation and into the commercial arena. So you start to see this pipeline will start to fruitify within the next. Well, it's already fruitified. So the project we've talked about before with the joint venture with the or the uh, the co-investment with the uh, Japanese customer. Well, we're still manufacturing that project and we've we're started construction on the asset that will enable us to manufacture the commercial volumes. So that asset is going to be complete in the next year. 
and then we'll be into commercial volumes, which will be fairly significant based on what their forecast is. So beyond 20 million for that particular project at maturity. So you know, nice projects. So that's the cycle in terms of timing. In terms of value, it's so difficult to say because API volumes are different for every API. Indications are different. Scale is different. So we don't look at it as a blended number. We can't say that out of the 16 APIs, the average value is going to be $5,000 a kilo or $50,000 a kilo. We have projects that are spread across the platform from you know, projects that are you know, maybe $1,000 a kilo right the way up to $60,000, $100,000 a kilo. But $100,000 a kilo would be an ABC, for example. So the volume is quite low because the potency is quite high. So it is difficult to say. We, we can be more specific about individual projects. And then, yeah, thank you, thank you. And one more question is on the vitamin D. So we just yeah. had a uh, excellent growth on uh, about 61%. So can we expect the same growth to be continuing in the coming quarters or else is this a, a drastic growth or one-time growth? No, no. I think we've been consistent about the vitamin D or the, 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 the product business up in Holland, which is essentially where we run it from. And there are activities across the rest of the group, including significantly India as well. But that platform, if you like, of cholesterol and vitamin D they're linked together and it's a product business. So we're not making custom products for people like we are in the rest of India or our Swiss facilities, for example. So these are products that we sell to the market. What we've seen is that by diversifying the way we sell, but also diversifying our customer base, we've been able to drive greater value. And we've been consistent about saying that was our strategy all the way through. We're now starting to see the outcome of the efforts of all of the time we've been pushing that. And as Hashil quite rightly says, the lumpiness that we will experience in this business is based on what we sell. So vitamin D sales in one month might be higher than cholesterol sales. Cholesterol sales may be higher than vitamin D in another month. What you can expect over a year is that those sorts of margins can be maintained. But looking at it from a monthly or a quarterly basis is challenging. What we have are our own, our own metrics internally, but it's difficult to say because it's a business where we're, we're, we're selling to customers and customer delivery, they want deliveries at certain times. It's not in our hands. The important bit about that business, and I'm giving you more information than you asked for, my apologies, but the important thing about that business is that we are now investing significantly in research and development of new indications, new ideas, new concepts, and new materials. And that's something that hasn't been done essentially since the acquisition of the business in 2007. So there's a real effort going on across uh, Holland and India uh, with joint project teams working to develop new products, which will extend the sustainability of this business way beyond uh, where where we uh, where we need to be, so we're very excited about that as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you for giving me this opportunity, and uh, all the best for your future and yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Any participants who wish to ask a question, they may please press star and one at this time. The next question is from the line of Satish Bhatt from Anvil Shares and Stock Broking. Please go ahead. Hey, it's a congratulations on the good set of numbers. Mark, this is question is regarding you in your opening comments. You told you started one project on the infection side with some, you are doing a collaborative work with some European university. Can you throw some light on that? And uh, after sure. I think what you got a uh, good initial data of your vitamin D uh, regarding obese patients. So what are, what are the plans regarding taking that product uh, further, you know? And what are the sure. timelines or the milestones which you have to further achieve it to make it a commercial success? Certainly. Thank you for your question. So the first one about infection control, what we've been looking at, and this is something that Arpin and I have been talking about for probably 18 months. Certainly, it came up 
as a big issue when COVID started to rear its very ugly head. We have a product which we've talked about uh, in various discussions over the years, so it's not a secret. We have a product called Octenidine, which was uh, developed by Mr. Vias Senior, up its father a few years ago. And it's a tremendous product for um, bacterial bacteria side. So there aren't too many bacteria that can withstand octenidine. What we've been doing in India is we've been developing a process to encapsulate that product to extend its efficacy over time. So when you apply it on a surface, instead of the efficacy being you know, a couple of hours, the encapsulation process, which our R&D team has developed, enables that effect to be longer. So we're excited about that as a product in itself. However, to really have a very effective product to surface, cleanse, and protect human beings, we also need to have a virucidal impact. And octenidine doesn't have that. So what we've been looking at internally is what other materials have a virucidal effect as well. And if we can find a material that has a virucidal effect, how do we link it to our octenidine encapsulation? to create a single product, which is a super disinfectant, handling both viruses and bacteria. So we've now got some ideas. We've kind of tested those ideas with a world expert in, uh, in, in a university in Central Europe. And we have uh, just, just uh, formalized a collaboration. So what will happen is they, he, this professor in his laboratory with his team We'll be looking at characterizing what we have today and looking at screening various materials, and we have a very short target list. And then what will happen is that Dishman, Carbogen Answers, will bring those materials back in house and create the overall manufacturing IP. Um, we're at the very early stages. We only started talking to the university after Christmas, but we have signed a letter of intent. And uh, we're ready, we're going to and, I, and we've given the go ahead. So that project has just started. Answering your second question, so we talked about the uh, the, the the work we did in the USA with uh, obesity patients. We have now agreed a program in the US to look at a wider subset of obese patients. We've also just this week signed off a side project for calcitonin where we are looking at uh, certain subsets of how that material is absorbed within, within certain um, bodily generated molecules. I don't want to say too much because we do have competitors in this field, so um, we do need to be cautious about what we say. But that's been signed off today as well. The other exciting news is that we reached a conclusion on Monday this week with uh, an eminent um, uh, professor who is going to start to look at now putting together a clinical trial which we're going to perform in India and we're looking at a certain subset of patients and a, and a strategy there. And that follows on for, um, from our uh, very small Iranian uh, study that we carried out late last year. So progress, as we promised, is, is being made and agreements are being signed and formal commitments have been made. So those projects are ongoing and we will be able to give you limited updates, um, bearing in mind that we don't want to alert the competition too much as to what we're doing. Uh, sir, you, I think last time you, uh, the, I think the first set of your uh, calcifidual data was out, I think they were, you were even expecting your data on COVID to be also be out, you know? So are the data still yep. out or are still the data assumption is still happening? The data from Iran is out. And that has driven in a large part our strategy for going to a wider population of patients. So uh, are you going to make that data public? It will be made public at some point in a, uh, in a, uh, a peer-reviewed journal, not in a commercial journal, but in a peer-reviewed journal by the uh, clinicians who ran that study, we have the data, so we've moved already. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your question. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. A reminder to participants, if you wish to ask a question, please press star and one. The next question is from the line of Naman Jain. 
as an individual investor please go ahead yeah uh, hi uh, congratulations for a uh, good set of numbers for the company uh, good improvement being seen on q on q basis uh, i have a couple of questions before which just one clarification uh, in the opening remarks uh, mr majumdar uh, said that uh, bavla facility is uh, about 60% up and running so i'm presuming this about 7 or 8 units out of the 13 that we have are already uh, running that's right okay okay and uh, so uh, the on the questions front uh, one was that i believe uh, after commercialization of molecules so we already have seven molecules which are approved in last 2 3 years and a few more which will keep getting approved over next few years so the margins ebitda margins are higher uh, upwards of uh, 30 40% if i'm not wrong uh so the blended ebitda margins for the company in next 3 4 5 years should shouldn't they be above 30% or so mm, yes naman so that's uh, that's our internal target to move forward towards uh, 30% and uh, you know then let's see you know how things go uh but yeah the target is to move towards 30% in the next 3 uh, to 4 years time right and a uh, second question is in regards to co investment opportunity that we are currently uh, having with the japanese customers uh, i think in the last call we also spoke about a similar opportunity with some uk based customers so uh, how is it progressing that was the us yeah it was a us based customer US based um, yeah yeah and we've so already that's... they already co invested with us 2 years ago um to 3 years ago to get their uh, clinical trial supply material and we did that project we now have a further co-investment which is now starting um at our uh, Hunchensville site in Switzerland and that will enable us to manufacture their commercial volumes and so their their projected commercial volumes um we were going to make a press release on that one but the customer is uh, does not want to make a press release all right thanks thanks so much so it's going forward Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Dhruv Shah from Ambika Fincap. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi thanks. This is Nishit Charger. Thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on a good set of number. My Thank question you. is uh, broadly on a strategy that uh, if you are working on uh, vitamin D analog which can substantially add value and uh, margins also and uh, now we are working on the antiviral products as well as on anti depression products would it be correct to say that uh, we will have a non linear growth in the future that's a really good question i think our goal if we talk about the corporate goal which is something that that when arpic came in and took over substantially running the business on a day to day basis His goal was very clear that we need to diversify our business a bit more than we were diversified. We are looking at various opportunities to strengthen our product pipeline. We recognize that if you have a product of need and you are the innovator then you have much more control over over the value generation of that project. When you do just service work free for service, you're a lot of what you do is under the control of the customer in terms of his is grow what he's doing with the project. So one of the strategies that our team has laid down for the uh, for the leadership team of the business is to look at our product portfolio, leverage as much as we can out of the current product portfolio, but also put more time and effort into R&D to use the, the the knowledge and the experience we have within our global scientific teams to generate new ideas to generate new products. so what we will see i we, what we are our goal is that we are going to have a larger proportion than today of products in our business that doesn't mean that the growth in the crams business will be stunted we're pushing both ends of it because crams is our our heartland that's our core but the product side of the business has tremendous opportunities we believe and what we're doing now is evaluating them and pushing some of those So you'll see a larger proportion of margin generation long term from the product side of the business. And that diversifies the company, makes it more sustainable on the long term because 
You know, we don't know what's going to happen with the money market. Uh, 2008 was a complete disaster for the pharmaceutical industry, um, with small to medium biotech being decimated with lack of venture money going in. We don't know if that's going to happen again. We can't predict it. What we can do is we can set our business in the right way to have enough diversity to withstand hits like that and continue to grow the business. So that's really the global strategy of the company. Um, I think, is that fair to say, Arthur? Absolutely, no, you said it uh, spot on. Yeah. Uh, so that's the vision for the business going forward. Yeah, go ahead, Mark, please. So that's the vision of the business going forward. So you see with, with our remarks regarding uh, R&D. By the end of this year, uh, Hashil will be able to give uh, all of you a picture of the increase in spend that we are promoting within our product business. And that should be seen as being a highly positive thing. Um, because with a product business, if you don't invest in R&D, sooner or later your products become commoditized. And we were starting to see that happening. So we're not losing the good work that was done in the past on our product business, but we're leveraging that and we're putting more money in to take it even further. Um, and, and I'm sure that uh, at the close of this year, then we'll be able to give you a picture of a percentage spend of, uh, of our accruals and what we're putting back into the business in terms of product R&D. But it is a clear strategy of the business. Absolutely clear strategy and goal. So, Mark, a related question on the same. You have a large ADC expansion going on in Switzerland. You have an injectable uh, new project, greenfield project going on, uh, where you just mentioned in your opening remarks that the building has been constructed in the France. So that will also add value. You have a cramps pipeline, uh, which is a very large and uh, 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 with a lot of cutting edge products. And now you are also having these product related strategies. Uh, when, with what kind of company you, do you benchmark or are you uh, 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 the one and only right now globally or you benchmark no, we don't. or with we, which we, we don't benchmark, sorry, we don't benchmark against other companies. Um, in the cram side of the business, in the fee-for-service business, there are a number of competitors, uh, and I've been consistent about this. We have some good competition out there, but there aren't many companies like Dishman, Cardigan, Ansys who have the geographical spread and technical capability that we have. There are companies out there that do, but not many. Um, in the product side of the business, in the vitamin D side of the business, we have two competitors. Okay. And those two competitors, one is European-based and they're very big, but they're also diversified. And we have a Chinese company that is uh, heavily invested in, in, in the vitamin D side of the business and some other things. Um, so our competition strategy is very much dependent on our understanding of the market for each of the products or services that we are providing to the market. So it may sound like it's a lot of activity, but it's not. We've been growing the crams business for years, and we will never stop. Uh, I do want to correct one thing, though. We're not building a large-scale ADC facility. We're building more reactor capacity in Europe to address the pipeline we have. The ADC business, we are waiting. Um, we built a facility, I think, five years ago, Hashida? Yeah, about five to six years back. Yeah. We built a facility that enabled us to go to clinical phase two, or very small phase three and commercial very small. Um, that facility is filling up, and we have a couple. We have one particular project for a German customer, which is very very promising indeed. And validation is drawing to a close now on that one. We have a follow up molecule from that customer, and we have another couple of projects that are waiting in the pipeline. So ABCs and doing the actual drug conjugate bit which is linking the biologic to the synthetic chemical, is something that we have invested in, and we are now looking at how successful and how positive that is before we make the next step of investment. Okay, 
So that's the only thing I wanted to correct you with. With the, with the formulation business, we see real opportunity in doing the API and also being able to do the formulation. But again, it's focused on niche, difficult to do things. We're not going to go and compete with Patreon. Uh, Patreon has been in the business of formulation for 40 years and they have massive capacity everywhere. That's not where we're going to compete. We're competing in an area in the market where there is an unmet need. A company that's flexible can handle really tricky products and can do it flexibly, fast and quick and, and at a high level of quality. And that's where we know we can compete and we can make money. Great. Uh, that's, uh, very useful, Mark. But uh, my last question is, we have more than 25 products which have gone commercial. Uh, are yeah. we seeing the follow-on commercial uh, uh, API manufacturing orders from those uh, innovators companies? Yeah, I think generally we are. There's been one or two that have dropped off the radar. And we anticipate that in our, in our forward planning anyway. So, you know, if we say we've got a pipeline of, of, of late phase three and validation projects that are somewhere between 15 and 18, I do not expect all 15 and 18 to fructify in the next five years. I'm a realist. I know what happens in this industry. Things die, business changes. Our customers have their own competitors. So, you know, if, 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 if a competitor of AstraZeneca brings out their product six months earlier, then the sales of AstraZeneca for that particular molecule, if it's a competing molecule, is going to be critically in, in damaged. Um, so, you know, we, we always put a bit of a tolerance on it. So that's why we say, and we've been consistent in saying, you know, it's, it's one and a half or so every, you know, sort of one and a half to two years. If it's better than that, we're happy. If it's on that line, we're also happy because that's what we predicted. And there's a tolerance of failure in there because we know what the industry failure rates are. But we're familiar with it, I should say. I shouldn't say we know. I think we're familiar. So not all of them are going to be uh, not all of them are going to be products. You know, and regardless of what customers' forecasts are, a forecast of a product that hasn't been launched in the market yet is just a number. Um, you know, until you really are in the market, you just don't know because uptake is different in different countries. Uh, you know, the the, the co-investment with the Japanese customer, at the moment, uh, we're in discussions with them and they're talking about different numbers, you know, and they're different numbers positively. But again, the message is they just don't know. But the, the message they're getting back from clinicians and, and getting back from the market is that, you know, this, this product is going is, is, is to be a real product of need. And they're looking at different, different indications of cancer now as well. So who knows? And that's the thing with a service business. You are in the hands of the customer from a marketing perspective. Once you're making the product, the customer's marketing his own product. And that's why ARPIT wants us to put more emphasis back on product as well. So that that risk, which will always exist, is mitigated somewhat by this organization using its skill and knowledge and experience in science to generate some of our own products. And we have more control over that and more predictability over it. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose in, in one way, what I would say is we're listening to the investors. We're listening to the market where the market is asking us to put a plan together to make this business grow and be sustainable in the long term. And that's what the leadership of this business is doing. Thanks, Mark, uh, and all the best. To Thank the you. Thanks program. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any participants who wish to ask a question may please press star and one. We have the next question from the line of Rajesh. As an digital investor, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, maybe a couple of questions um, from my side. One would be uh, on your Babla uh, site. So how? So when we would be seeing 100% operation uh, in, in that particular site? And the second question would be on uh, uh, on the European business. I think recently Europe has propo had proposed uh, carbon border tax, uh, given that most of your facilities are in Europe. So would you benefit from such kind of measure in the future?
So, uh, so Rajesh, as far as uh, the Babla site is concerned, uh, what we expect is that uh, we should be back to 70% of the grants revenue that we were generating from Babla uh, during the course of the current financial year. And, uh, uh, and, and some of the units uh, would, would be started uh, progressively in the current financial year. Uh, part of them would be started in the in the next financial year. So I think uh, sometime during Q1 or Q2 of next year, we should start seeing Babla back to the cramps revenue that it was generating uh, in a normalized year. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so I think from the other question you had, um, we're watching to see what's happening because although we are in Europe, um, from a geographical perspective, from a political perspective, um, you know, we are a bit more diversified than that. So the, the, the main part of the crown service business at early phase and niche phase is in Switzerland, which isn't part of the EU. Um, and of course, then we have our facilities in France and Holland. So we're watching what's happening with that. But more importantly, what we're doing is we're looking at ways of being able to reduce the volumes of uh, volatile organics. Uh, by developing processes that don't need those, those volumes. We're also looking at um, techniques to be able to be more sustainable with, uh, with our waste management. So um, and these are things that, that, that are ongoing projects, you know, thermal oxidization and things like that, and being able to get rid of our waste ourselves, but also to be able to generate heat and power from that waste. So again, you know, creating virtuous circles with these things rather than, you know, taxes which are essentially designed to uh, to encourage people to do cross-border stuff, frankly. But we are watching it, and we will never say never. But once policies are in place or are proposed to the uh, to the Senate of the European Union, then we will develop we will develop our own strategies of how we manage that and how we address it. Okay. Maybe a follow-up on, on Bavla, Bavla site. Uh, so why, why it is uh, taking so much uh, time? Like I, I believe that uh, most of the approvals have already come and uh, why we are not able to scale it, scale it up to 100% as soon as possible? So, uh, so Rajesh, uh, we, have, uh, we have been receiving clearances from the customers on the CRAM side. Uh, and uh, we have received purchase orders that need to be serviced. Uh, during the course of the current financial year, so essentially in Q3 and Q4. Uh, but the real ramp up, you know, for, for the full year revenue to get realized, uh, you know, it would be only in the next financial year. There are certain customers, uh, you know, where we are yet to receive the clearance or we are still in the process of negotiating the commercial terms for the quantities that they require. Uh, because, you know, what, what we have also done is that we have gone back to certain customers, revised the the pricing of the uh, of the products that they want to source from us, um, uh, because you know there has been a, there will be an increased cost where we would be uh, kind of dedicating certain certain units or certain equipments to that particular customer, and hence um, we we have gone back to the customers with the revised costing and the revised selling price. So uh, that process is going on right now as we speak. Um, and uh, the EDQM audit per se would be uh, it would be sometime in the in, in, I would say in Q1 of next financial year uh, or in Q4 of the current financial year once we have all the upgradations that we wish to implement uh, that is already done to our satisfaction then we can write to the EDQM to do a remote inspection or a physical inspection. Also, all of the units in Babla, they are starting progressively. So, um, you know, last year at this time, we, we had stopped operations uh, completely. Uh, but then one after the other, as we received clearances from these customers on the CRAM side, we have been starting one after the other uh, manufacturing unit out of that particular site. So right now, as we speak, we have about um, six, six units which are up and running. And uh, we would start another two to three units in the next uh, three months or so. So it is, it is a progressive thing. And um, uh, in order to cater to these purchase orders that we have received, you know, the cycle time to manufacture is, is a minimum of uh, three to four months, if not more. 
So that is the reason, uh, you know, we are saying conservatively during the course of the next financial year, maybe in the first or the second quarter, we should see uh, the Babla revenue equivalent to what we were doing in a normal year. I think, I think also, could I just add that sure. you shouldn't underestimate that a year ago we had restructured the business, we had um, reduced our costs by reducing the number of staff. We were looking at changing the mix of our staff a uh, smaller number, but bringing in new people. And then COVID hit us, and especially in India, it was an absolute nightmare trying to hire people because people couldn't travel, they couldn't come to the site to talk with their interviews and things like that. And that hit, and that really hurt our timeline because this work can't be done by non-people. Um, so that was something we couldn't anticipate. Uh, and that had hurt us. Now, obviously, the situation is different now, and the rate of hiring uh, has increased substantially as a result. But that has hurt our timeline. I think that's fair to say, Hashir. So should we assume that from here on, incrementally, we would, we would see more uh, improved performance uh, quarter after quarter uh, from uh, Dishman, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's certainly the intention. That's the goal, absolutely, yeah. Okay. And maybe one more question uh, from a strategic perspective, uh, if I can ask, uh, given that uh, a significant part of your operations are concentrated in the European market and the way uh, we think we are seeing uh, the China plus one policy, people are uh, investing more and more uh, in, in Indian operations. So how do we see uh, this strategic? Uh, so should we say that we are uh, on the negative side? So we, we are, are basically a bit more disadvantageous uh, of having more expensive facilities in the European market than the people who are building operations in the Indian market? No. 50% of what comes out of Switzerland goes directly to North American customers. So although it's located in Switzerland, it's doing business across the world. Um, so, you know, from a strategic reach, we're not concerned that, that we have any deficiencies from a strategic reach. And traditionally, Carbogen, Carbogen Ansys, as an entity, has always had a very high level of uh, revenue and business flow from North America. That level has still remained. And what we've been able to do over the few years is to grow our, our European and Japanese business. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're not concerned about that at all. And I think, you know, our, our, we're strategically placed in India and, of course, in China. And the Chinese business uh, the facilities over in China are picking up very nicely. Um, and China is starting to develop its own manufacturing culture, if you like, for innovation culture. So we're actually working right now with, uh, on, on pulling together a scope of a project with a Chinese innovator. And they're looking to develop and, and introduce a brand new drug, not a Me Too. Um, and that's where carbage analysis can play very nicely because... You know, we have a we have a non-compete with our customers' promise. You know, we don't have any issues about uh, security of IP. And you know, Dishman Carbon Finances has had a very strong track record in that over the since the foundation of the business. And, and customers know that. Customers know our position on IP. Other companies maybe are a little more flexible with uh, customers' IP. We're very inflexible with customers' IP. It's all there. And, and those sorts of things, I, I don't, uh, I frankly don't see us as uh, being at a disadvantage. If we were at a disadvantage anywhere, it might be that a North American facility at some point might be, uh, might be an advantage. But at the moment, we don't see the cost outweighing, uh, outweighing the advantage of the cost benefiting it at the moment, unless a piece of technology came up. So no, we don't see that as a disadvantage at all. We really don't. I think the, the, the global spread and the integrated nature of our business uh, can only benefit customers. They have lots of opportunity to pick and choose. And okay. we have lots of opportunities. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. Again, Best of luck for, for I will add that actually it's an advantage rather than it being a disadvantage because very few companies have similar um, situational plans, very strategically located. In fact, all the relatively very high value and low volume products are even commercially uh, uh, manufactured in Switzerland, uh, 
and then when the volumes go, there is a seamless technology transfer where you know they can be migrated to India. So I think it's a wonderful combination, uh, and we have the best of both the worlds, or rather all the worlds, if I may say so, in terms of opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much. Sir. Best of luck for for the rest of the year and uh, time ahead. Thanks for your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Praveen Jadav. As an investor, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, one uh, answer. Uh, like, when will be the uh, JV with uh, the Japanese uh, revenue start? Uh, we've, uh, it's not a JV, it's a co-investment. So um, what they're doing, we're building a facility to enable them to reach their commercial volumes and they are co-investing in that facility with us. Uh, so it's not a joint venture. We, have, we don't have a, uh, a business relationship beyond them investing in the facility and we producing material. We already have generated, I think, Kashi, you may have to correct me here, but I think in this year, I think it's been $15 million, $20 million of revenue. Yeah, roughly about that much. You're right. And that's, that's the validation costs. Um, and, the, and, and bear in mind that this particular product, uh, we manufacture pieces of it in China, we manufacture pieces of it in the UK, and we manufacture pieces of it in Switzerland as well. So uh, it's, a, it's a really, really nice project for us because it utilizes assets across the platform. Um, so commercial volumes or commercial revenues will start to accrue um, towards the end of this fiscal year, but really kick in next year when the facility is completed. Okay, sir, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that would be our last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Pitras for closing comments. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, moderator, and thank you all for your uh, wonderful and insightful questions. All your questions always help us uh, to look at things in a different way and uh, give us an insight of uh, 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 the kind of uh, expectations uh, that you would have in terms of uh, the answers that uh, uh, we would be preparing and the information that we would be sharing. So please uh, uh, keep that up. Uh, it is a, a Truly great and honor for uh, us to be answering all of those questions. And uh, we hope that uh, we are doing so uh, uh, at your uh, full satisfaction. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you moderator. Thank you, sir.